Good morning, I see. It's very good to see you this morning. Let me pray for us. Our Father, in song we declared many great truths. Two that stood out are the fact that you know your children. Your word says, O oh Lord, you've searched me and known me. You know, when I sit down and when I rise up, you discern my thoughts from afar. Even before a word is on my tongue, behold, O oh Lord, you know it all together. We praise you, Father, that you know your children. You know exactly where we are as we walked in this room this morning, where we're coming from, what's on our hearts. We praise you, Father, that you know us. And we, we sang this morning, too, that you walk with us through the fire and the flood, and that that's what your word says, which would mean as the waters rush over us, you, that they're hitting you too, because you're with us. And, and when we experience the heat of the fire, you feel it too, because you're with us, close. And we praise you for that fact. And I pray that you would help us this morning. Because you know us, you can help us. We pray that your Holy Spirit would speak right to where we are through your word, this amazing word that we have preserved for us. We praise you for that word. Do your work, Holy Spirit. So we just invite you to come and invite you to work right where we need it because we so need it this morning. So please come. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So for the last several weeks, we've been examining Jacob's family, and most recently we've been giving special attention to the life of Joseph. When we meet Joseph at the beginning of chapter 37, he's 17 years old. Because Joseph is daddy's favorite, and because he's had dreams that his other, his other family members will one day bow down to him, Joseph's jealous brothers sell him into slavery to a group of Ishmaelite traders who take Joseph down to Egypt. Once in Egypt, a man named Potiphar, the captain of the guard, buys him. And when Potiphar sees that God is with Joseph and that God is blessing Potiphar because of Joseph, Potiphar promotes this young Hebrew slave to the position of his personal assistant, who is, in effect, in charge over all of Potiphar's estate. It's then that Potiphar's wife takes a liking to Joseph and tries to seduce him. And when Joseph refuse, refuses, she spins lies about him that ultimately get him thrown into an Egyptian prison. I would assume that it took some time for this to unfold, for Joseph to get noticed, to get promoted, bring prosperity to Potiphar's house, catch the eye of Potiphar's wife, resist her offers day after day, and then get himself thrown into prison. So perhaps, we don't know, but just a guess, perhaps he's 19 or 20 by the time he finds himself in jail. And even there, the end of Genesis 39 says this. But while Joseph was there in the prison, the Lord was with him. He showed him kindness and granted him favor in the eyes of the prison warden. So the warden put Joseph in charge of all those held in the prison, and he was made responsible for all that was done there. The warden paid no attention to anything under Joseph's care because... The Lord was with Joseph and gave him success in whatever he did. And that is where we pick up the story this morning in chapter 40. So if you would open your Bibles, follow along with me. Genesis chapter 40, we'll start in verse 1. And this will be out of the NIV if you want to follow along in that version. Genesis 40, verse 1. Sometime later, the cupbearer and the baker of the king of Egypt offended their master, the king of Egypt. Pharaoh was angry with his two officials, the chief cupbearer and the chief baker, and put them in custody in the house of the captain of the guard, in the same prison where Joseph was confined. The captain of the guard assigned them to Joseph, and he attended them. So again, I really find the passage of time in this story to be fascinating to think about. So by the end of this chapter, by the end of chapter 40, Joseph will be 28 years old, and he'll still have another two years in prison before he interprets Pharaoh's dreams and becomes the second in all of Egypt at age 30. So at some point between 1920 um, and age 28, probably not too much before Joseph turns 28, 
two new prisoners arrive in the jail. The prison, you'll notice, was in the house of the captain of the guard, verse 3. And who was the captain of the guard? Potiphar was Pharaoh's captain of the guard. So Joseph was located in a prison that was part of Potiphar's house or his compound of some sort. And Joseph ultimately remained under Potiphar's direct authority. Interestingly enough, then, that means that it was Potiphar who assigned these two new prisoners specifically to Joseph's care in verse 4. So notice how God was with Joseph, cared for him, and Joseph was now with these two prisoners and cared for them. God's children inevitably imitate the character of their good father. We read that these two new prisoners were Pharaoh's chief cupbearer and his chief baker. So we've got the guy who serves Pharaoh his wine, and we've got the guy who bakes Pharaoh his bread. And at some point, both offended. The word literally means sinned against Pharaoh. We don't know what they did, but as people with access to Pharaoh's food and drink, they would have been in prime position to carry out an assassination plot against Pharaoh had they so desired. Old Testament scholar Bruce Waltke says this about chief cupbearers. Kings often feared being poisoned, so they would trust cupbearers with their lives. And as a result, these officials were often wealthy and influential, as Egyptian texts testify. And it's interesting to note, Nehemiah was a cupbearer for another foreign king. Waltke quotes another scholar who explains, these officials, often foreigners, became in many cases confidants and favorites of the king and wielded political influence. And we see that in Nehemiah's case. So these two were very important people. Picking up in the middle of verse 4. After they had been in custody for some time, each of the two men, the cupbearer and the baker of the king, who were being held in prison, had a dream the same night, and each dream had a meaning of its own. When Joseph came to them the next morning, he saw that they were dejected. So he asked Pharaoh's officials, who were in custody with him in his master's house, why do you look so sad today? So again, some time passes between the arrival of these two and the night that they have their dreams. It probably wasn't too long, but it was long enough at least for Joseph to kind of get some idea of who these guys were because he notices one morning when he comes in, without saying a word, without them saying a word, he he sees and recognizes that there's something wrong and so he asks them. Joseph has been in jail for perhaps eight years by this point after being falsely accused. And he's asking other people why they look so sad. How had Joseph not turned completely inward and completely bitter at the world by this point? That's what I would have done. Somehow, despite all that had happened, he was able to reach out to these two men and just very simply say, hey, why so sad today? Verse 8, we both had dreams, they answered, but there's no one to interpret them. Then Joseph said to them, Do not interpretations belong to God? Tell me your dreams. Dreams play a very prominent role in the story of Joseph's life. In fact, they've played prominent roles in Joseph's family now for generations. Jacob had significant dreams from God. Jacob's uncle Laban had a dream. Of course, Joseph had had two when he was 17 years old. God would later appear to Jacob's descendant, Solomon, in a dream to the prophet Daniel in dreams. Jesus' earthly father, Joseph, was directed by God through four different dreams at the beginning of Matthew. We'll see next week on Pentecost Sunday that the prophet Joel promised that God's spirit would be poured out on his people and that they would see visions and have dreams, Joel 2.28. And throughout the Bible, it's not only members of God's covenant people who have dreams. Um, Members outside of God's covenant people have significant dreams at times, like Abimelech in Genesis, Nebuchadnezzar, the wise men, Pilate's wife. So what do we do with that? I think we could go wrong probably in at least two directions. 
So on the one hand, we could become overly focused on our dreams. We could try to live our lives based on every dream that we might have. I don't think, generally speaking, that's what God wants from us, for us. I don't think God wants us to analyze every single dream that we have and then try to understand some deeper meaning in it. Now, why do I say that? I I would say that for two reasons. So the first is this. Even though dreams do play a very significant role in the story of the life of Joseph, note how relatively infrequent they actually are. Okay, so Joseph has two dreams when he's 17. It's a full 11 years um, before Joseph interprets the dream of the cupbearer and the baker. And then it's two years after that that Joseph interprets Pharaoh's dream. So we've got a total of six dreams spread out over a 13-year period. Joseph himself only had two of those. He's, He's only involved in interpreting the other four. So it seems pretty clear that Joseph was not having significant life-altering dreams nightly upon which he was basing all of his decisions, right? My second reason for saying that we shouldn't live our lives day-to-day based on dreams is that as we examine Joseph's life, in most cases, Joseph didn't need special dreams to decide how to live from day-to-day. He didn't need a dream to tell him not to accept Potiphar's wife's repeated invitations. He didn't need a dream to tell him to be a vessel through which God was going to extend his blessing to all the nations of the earth, even to the household of the man who had bought him as a traffic slave. Joseph knew the character of his God. He knew the promises of God. And he knew God was faithful, and that that was enough. He didn't need dreams to tell him how to live. He just simply needed to be obedient and faithful to the revelation that he already had. In general, especially for the believer today who lives under the new covenant, that's us, in Christ and in his revealed word, in most cases we know how we should be living our lives and we don't require dreams for that information. And I'll say, you know, We tend to think that, for example, what university I attend, or whom I marry, or what job I take, or what country I move to, are among the most significant decisions that we make in our lives. I would disagree. I would contend that your daily decision to love God and your neighbor as yourself, that's one of the most important decisions that you will make day after day. Where you work is by far secondary, and you don't need a dream to tell you to love God and your neighbor as yourself, or to flee from sin, or to pursue righteousness, and on and on we could go, right? So, why shouldn't we base our lives around dreams? On the one hand, that's one temptation we might, that's one way we might get it wrong. One, the Bible makes it clear that even though God can and does communicate with his people through dreams, It's not the norm, and it's never really been the norm for God's people. Even people in the Bible who do have these significant dreams, if you look, they might have a couple throughout their entire lifetimes. And two, the norm for God's people is for them to live their lives in accordance with the revealed will of God that they already have. So that's one way we as Christians could get dreams wrong. We could become too obsessed. That's not, I don't think, how God wants his people to live. On the other hand, we could get to the point where we completely ignore dreams altogether, right? We could discount all people who claim that they've ever had a significant dream. And I I don't think the Bible allows us to make that mistake either. The Bible's clear. Sometimes God does, in fact, communicate with both believers and non-believers through significant dreams. I think many of, this, many of us in this room could probably share stories. So I would conclude that there's no good biblical reason to dismiss dreams altogether. All right? So then what do we do? 
if we or someone we know has had a dream that feels especially significant. I'd say there's a lot that could be said. I'm going to say this much. But I do think Joseph and the rest of the Bible are both very helpful here. Because let's notice the very first thing that Joseph says about dreams. First thing he says, do not interpretations belong to God. So if we are going to understand any meaning that we might see from any significant dream that we might have, that understanding will come from God alone. So we should never seek to find the meaning of our dreams from secular psychologists or dream interpreters who belong to other religions or fortune tellers or anything like that. Okay? We, we go to God. And we should expect that he's, he'll help us. He's the one who interprets dreams. Second, I think this is connected, we should always weigh our dreams against the revealed word of God. This is where I think it could be really helpful for you to talk about your significant dream with other mature believers and seek God's interpretation together. Others might have insight into how your dream lines up with the revealed pages of God's word or not. A dream that's from God will be consistent with what he's already spoken, and it won't contradict it. If we don't do this step, if we don't very seriously compare our dreams with the revealed word of God, we might find ourselves guilty of what God says in Jeremiah 23, 25 through 29. There God says, I have heard what the prophets say who prophesy lies in my name. They say, I had a dream. I had a dream. How long will this continue in the hearts of these lying prophets who prophesy the delusions of their minds? They think the dreams they tell one another will make my people forget my name just as their ancestors forgot my name through Baal worship. Let the prophet who has a dream recount the dream. Okay, yeah. But let the one who has my word speak it faithfully. Listen to this. God, God said this. For what has straw to do with grain. Straw, like dreams. What does that have to do with grain? The revealed word of God, declares the Lord. Is not my word like fire, declares the Lord, and like a hammer that breaks a rock in pieces? So dreams are always subordinate to the revealed word of God. They are as inferior to the revealed word of God as straw is to grain. So let's be clear, God does not take kindly to people who think their dreams are enough somehow to contradict his revealed word. So obviously, the question then, very simple. Do you know God's word well enough to compare and see where these things line up or not? So in summary, if we have a significant dream, let's run to God the ultimate interpreter of dreams, and let's seek wise counsel from others who can help us hold our dreams up against the standard of God's word. So again, there's a lot we could say. There's a lot we should say. But for now, let's get back to Joseph. We left him in jail. I'll summarize verses 9 to 13. The cupbearer tells Joseph his dream first. He says he had a dream in which he saw a grapevine growing. The grapevine had three branches. As the cupbearer watched, the branches budded, blossomed, and produced grapes. The cupbearer took some of the grapes, squeezed the grape juice out of them, put them in a cup, and gave them to Pharaoh. Joseph says, here's the meaning. In three days, Pharaoh will lift up your head, meaning Pharaoh will honor you, and give you your old job back. Then Joseph says in verse 14, but when all goes well with you, remember me, show me kindness, mention me to Pharaoh, get me out of this prison. I was forcibly carried off 
from the land of the Hebrews, and even here, I've done nothing to deserve being put in a dungeon. He's 28 years old. He's been in Egypt 11 years, and he's probably been in this Egyptian jail for most of that 11 years. He just wants to go home. Summarizing verses 16 through 19, the chief baker then thinks, well, that sounds pretty good. Let me tell my dream to Joseph. In the baker's dream, he saw three baskets sitting on his head. Then the birds came and ate all the baked goods out of the top basket. Joseph says, here's what your dream means. In three days, Pharaoh will also lift off your head. Play on words with what Joseph had just told the cupbearer. And Pharaoh will impale your body on a pole, and the birds will eat your flesh. Some translations say here, hang you on a tree. The meaning does seem to be that he would be hung up somehow from a stake, or in fact be impaled on a pole. But the baker's fate is that he'll be executed, and instead of giving a proper burial, his dead body will be hung up for the birds to come and eat as a warning for what happens to those people who cross Pharaoh. To summarize verses 20 through 22, sure enough, three days later, the cupbearer is restored to his position serving Pharaoh, got his old job back. Whew. Sure enough, the baker is executed and hung on a stake for the birds, just like Joseph said. Verse 23, the chief cupbearer, however, did not remember Joseph. He forgot him. Just like Joseph, apparently, the cupbearer had been falsely accused and thrown into prison. You would think, having just regained his own freedom, having experienced the relief that it would have been to finally get out of prison, he of all people would remember Joseph to Pharaoh, and yet he doesn't. In fact, the cupbearer forgets all about Joseph. So you see, the whole chapter builds, right? You've got the Pharaoh's cupbearer and baker arrive in prison. Hmm, these are influential people. Interesting. Potiphar, ass Potiphar assigns these two specifically to Joseph. What a, what a coincidence. Interesting, yeah. They have dreams. Hmm. Joseph interprets the dreams. The cupbearer returns to his place of, of this trusted and influential position before Pharaoh. So surely this is it, right? That surely Joseph is just days away from vindication and being able to find the his freedom and go home. And by the end of chapter 40, any hope of that is completely shattered. So the way I figure it, this must have been the low point in, in the whole story of Joseph's life that we have recorded for us. So remember this overall trajectory of Joseph's life so far. He was the beloved son of his father. Then he became a traffic slave. Okay, then he became a privileged slave. Then he became a falsely accused prisoner. Okay, then he became a privileged falsely accused prisoner. And today we find him as a forgotten falsely accused prisoner. I'm just, I'm not sure how much lower Joseph could have gone. And again, after reading chapter 41, verse 1, we see that 28-year-old 28 28 year Joseph remained in prison for two more years after this. What was going on in Joseph's mind during that time? How long did he keep up hope? Like really, like, you know, one day, any day now, okay, the cupbearer is going to come waltzing back into the prison. He's going to have a royal decree from Pharaoh. He's going to free me. He's going to give me permission to go back home to my family. I haven't seen my family in 11 years. How long did it take him to finally realize that that selfish, ungrateful, good-for-nothing cupbearer had completely forgotten about him? And how did he feel once he came to that grim realization. And this is where we end the story of Joseph for this week. 
How do you survive something like that? How do you keep hope alive when you've sunk lower than you ever thought it was possible to sink? Apparently, very much unlike the cupbearer, Joseph didn't forget, even when he was forgotten. What did Joseph not forget? Undoubtedly, Joseph knew his family's history. So he knew that the one creator God of the universe had chosen his great-grandfather Abraham and had given him very great promises. God had promised to bless their family. God had promised to bless those who blessed them and to curse those who cursed them. God had promised that they would be a blessing to all the people on the earth. God had promised that he was with this family and that he was their shield and their very great reward. God had promised that he was their God and that they were his people. And Joseph knew that their family's God kept his promises. So no doubt he knew the story of his great-grandfather and his great-grandmother and the son that God gave them after waiting 25 years. And he knew that God had always protected and provided for his family, even when it looked hopeless. So Joseph never forgot about his God's promises and his God's faithfulness to fulfill those promises. I think we can safely assume that. He hadn't forgotten those things. And I don't think Joseph ever forgot about those dreams that he had had all those years before. So think, think about this for a second. If he had given up on ever seeing his dreams fulfilled, do you think he would have been so quick to tell the cupbearer and baker that all interpretations belong to God and that God could give them a meaning of their dreams? I mean, personally, if it had been me 11 years in and looking at the situation I was in, I would have said something like this to the baker and to the cupbearer. You had dreams, did you? I had dreams once. Yeah. And look where they've gotten me. Piece of advice, forget your dreams. Apparently, Joseph was still holding on to what God had revealed to him all those years ago. We've been given something that is to dreams as grain is to straw. We've got something more sure than a dream we had when we were 17. We've got the full revelation of God's plan for his people made known to us in the life, death, and resurrection and ascension of Jesus Christ. In Christ, God is affirming his greatest and most precious promises to his people, the promise of his presence with us throughout our lives, the promise of hope even in the face of death, the promise of resurrection after death, the promise of glorification just as Jesus himself was glorified, and the promise of living at peace with God in his presence forever. That's what we have in Christ. We've got a greater hope than, Je than Joseph could have ever even begun to imagine. So whatever dungeon you might find yourself in this morning, what do you need to remember in order to not lose hope? Might I suggest 2 Timothy 2, 8 through 13? We read it this morning. Remember Jesus Christ. Remember, Paul says, in the same way that Joseph must have remembered the faithfulness of his family's God, Paul tells Timothy to remember Jesus Christ. Jesus has changed everything. It's a new ball game. Now, Paul says, remember Jesus Christ, risen from the dead. Remember, Christian, that Jesus didn't remain dead, and neither will you. Even when you close your eyes for the last time, on this earth, you'll open them again in the presence of God. Remember Jesus Christ, risen from the dead, the offspring of David is preached in my gospel, for which I am suffering, bound with chains as a criminal, but the word of God is not bound. So remember, 
Christian, that even when you find yourself bound with chains, literal or metaphorical, for the sake of the gospel, the word of God, the promises of God are not bound. God will accomplish everything he's promised that he'll do. Period. Remember that. Paul goes on. Therefore, I endure everything for the sake of the elect, you know, like wrongful imprisonment, for example, that they also may obtain the salvation that is in Christ Jesus with eternal glory. Joseph's chains saved the Egyptians and all of God's people at the time, Jacob's family. Joseph's chains apparently saved people from other nations as well. Paul's chains resulted in the salvation of the elect who were in Christ Jesus. Similarly, Christian, we should not be surprised if in some way that we can't really even comprehend now, our own chains will eventually result in helping God's elect obtain the salvation that is in Christ Jesus with eternal glory. So remember that, Christian. Paul goes on to say, the saying is trustworthy, for if we have died with him, we will also live with him. If we endure, we will also reign with him. If we deny him, he also will deny us. If we are faithless, he remains faithful, for he cannot deny himself. Remember, Christian, that because you have already died with Christ, you will one day be raised from the dead. Remember the hope of one day, I mean, one day reigning over creation with the exalted Christ. Remember that if we deny him, he will also deny us. And yet, even when we are faithless, he remains faithful to do what he has promised to do. So our hope, again, is so much fuller and richer and clearer and more glorious than Joseph's hope. But you've got to remember that hope found in Jesus Christ, especially in your darkest moments. So when you've hit rock bottom and then you've gone a little bit farther down, remember Jesus Christ. When you've been sold as a slave and lied about and unjustly thrown into prison and forgotten and cast into obscurity in an Egyptian jail, right there in those moments, Remember what God has revealed to you, Christian, which is so much more than what God had revealed to Joseph at that time. Joseph had God's promises, his family's history, and a few dreams that he had had when he was 17. By comparison, we have Jesus Christ. And what he accomplished for us is the guarantee of all God's promises to his people. So Christian, remember let me pray for us. Our Father in heaven, Peter wrote that um, I will always remind you of these things, even though you know them and are firmly established in the truth you now have. And we know these things, Father. We, we know that you're with us and that you're good and that you're faithful. You keep your promises. We know the hope we have because of Jesus and what he's done. And we recognize again this morning we need help we need to be reminded you need to help us not to forget so holy spirit we invite you to come stir within us and help us not to forget help us to remember at all times these just jaw-dropping truths that you revealed to us and i pray that we'd experience the hope and the joy and the peace this type, that these promises are supposed to produce within us. And I ask these things, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen.